So my name is Corey Ricketson. I'm vice president for Pulsera and primarily work in the Texas uh, operations. My background uh, was an operator. I was a paramedic for Austin Travis County EMS for years. I was on our statewide disaster task force, Texas Task Force One, uh, where I did work alongside Eric Epley. Uh, but I've been with Pulsera for about four years. I've actually been in healthcare technology for the past 15 or so. And um, so I'd like to introduce Eric as well. And I know this little intro is not gonna do him any justice. So Eric, why don't you go ahead and, and say a little bit about your background. I think it's pretty impressive. Sure, uh, thanks Corey. Uh, thanks Kelly, this is, uh, my name's Eric Epley. I'm the executive director and CEO at uh, the Southwest Texas Regional Advisory Council, which we just say STRAC, it's easier, in San Antonio, Texas. Uh, I've been doing that job for about 20 some odd years. Um, my clinical background was as a paramedic on the ground, flight paramedic with San Antonio Air Life back in the 90s. Um, and uh, I was also uh, on the Texas Task Force One USAR team on the Swift Water uh, rescue side and uh, was a strike team leader um, at Katrina, Hurricane Katrina with the Texas Task Force One. Um, I've uh, uh, I was a sheriff's deputy um, and a tactical operator paramedic for uh, about 12 years um, while I was on the helicopter. And uh, then I got uh, selected to um, work at, at STRAC when we first got started and uh, been there ever since. So that's me. Yeah. And, you know, I think since I've known Eric for probably 20 years, I, I can say that, that truly uh, a, a huge mentor to me. Um, but also over the past three years, you know, we've had some really challenging times and I've watched Eric navigate the political climate, the, um, you know, certainly money and, and a lot of different things to try to navigate, you know, COVID and, and just really with surgical precision. Um, it's hard when you have a lot of A players that um, have their own stake and, and, and uh, priorities. And he's been able to navigate that. So I really, I, I was super excited to be able to get Eric on this uh, webinar because I think we can all learn a lot from his teachings and, and what's going on. So the first thing that I think would be important is really to try to understand a little bit about, you know, how Texas is structured. Um, you know, how, how do you figure out from a, a place so big as Texas how to find some uniformity, some standardization so that people aren't just doing their own thing and, and um, you know, we can actually move together in a certain direction. And this, this next slide is actually something that I think puts it into perspective, especially when you move Texas over Germany there in Europe. Um, so if you would just talk a little bit about how Texas is structured and a little bit about, about that background and how we got to where we are today. For those on the call who don't know, regional advisory councils in Texas are uh, uh, legislatively created um, there was uh, legislation in 1989, in fact, to build the Texas trauma system. And the short elevator speech of that is RACs are there to uh, develop, implement, and maintain the regional trauma and emergency healthcare systems. Uh, we're 501c3s. The regional advisory councils uh, are, are made up of uh, the EMS agencies and the hospitals in a specific geographic region. Um, they have to have at least a level three, but usually they have a level one or two trauma center uh, around that, and so it's sort of the catchment area for those those uh, regional trauma centers. Um, we're 501c3s, uh, but we're quasi-governmental basically because of the legislation, that the way they were created and designated by the health department, by the state health department. But as our, uh, over the racks, we have another group at the state level called GTAC. It's the Governor's EMS and Trauma Advisory Council. That's appointed by the governor, and then we have subcommittees underneath the council itself. So there's the typical things you would expect: trauma, cardiac, stroke, air medical, EMS, EMS medical directors, pediatrics, injury prevention, and then uh, there's a disaster committee. There's a disaster preparedness committee that I've chaired uh, pretty much for the last 15 years, and uh, it's really through there that I think we've we've been able to build a lot of our our programs. Yep. So I'm trauma service area P, that uh, kind of blue area. And then um, uh, we have uh, about 3 million people here in, in and around San Antonio, 26,000 square miles, a um, bunch of EMS guys, a bunch of hospitals, level one traumas, two level one trauma centers, um, PCI centers, stroke centers, et cetera. 
Um, San Antonio is the seventh largest city in the country. Um, one of the problems we had during COVID, uh, I think we can kind of jump to that, Corey, that would make the most sense. Um, okay. we, we had challenges with uh, the medics wearing, we, we went pretty quickly to half face respirators within 100 room protection um, for the MS guys. Uh, the N95s were fine, but they were limited in supply initially. And so uh, w we found the half face respirators pretty quickly and, and felt like that was a better fit um, for operations. The downside of that was calling patient report for the for the ambulances transporting patients was just really difficult to understand somebody talking uh, in, in, a, in a, you know, in a half face respirator. Uh, and so we started looking again for solutions that could uh, that were alternate to a patient report call in, you know, verbally. And uh, we had looked at Pulsera earlier and we revisited with them and felt like it was a good fit and uh, sort of talked statewide about it and felt like it was it would be a good fit across the state uh, at the same time. Yeah, there's a there's a good picture of a half face respirator. Yeah, so since he's kind of talking about what um you know the, the fact that they selected pulsera just to give the audience a little bit in case you don't know what pulsera is i'll just kind of go through a quick um what are we and uh it's an app that basically can go on mobile devices as well as we've got browser version but it allows people to get pulled into a dedicated commission communications channel for a, a patient event and essentially allow you to utilize this just like you would any other social media tool nowadays uh, with live video and team messaging and uploading images and audio clips and such. It also has with that live video, the ability to record that and also to have group video. And then the key is, is that we all are on the same channel. And I, I sort of talk about this, like if, if anybody's from the EMS environment or fire, you think about attack channel. Right. So like Eric, when we get dispatched to a fire and, and you pull in an engine and a ladder and a battalion chief and an EMS unit and we're all going to the scene and then we get to the scene and somebody gives a scene size up and says, hey, it's actually on fire. And then we uh, have a second alarm. But all of those apparatus are in the same channel. We're hearing everything. We have shared awareness. But um, when we get into the hospital environment and healthcare. Uh, we don't have that same shared awareness. So essentially what Pulsera does is it, it creates a dedicated patient channel uh, for a single patient event. And um, so as we are building that channel, any organization can start that, but the key is that they can bring in other organizations who can then add their own teams into the channel, who can then add other organizations and add teams and on and on it goes. But essentially, uh, the secret sauce of this is that we are all on the same communications tech channel, but it's within an app. So I, I see that my uh, slides are going a little bit slow. Is everybody seeing that, Kelly? Are you seeing that as well? It feels like it, like the how to build your system communications channel one just popped up. So yeah. that's really weird. Yeah. Um, so we started using Pulsera. We used iPads in the ER. Um, for our local, I, I'm, first of all, I'm, as a as a paramedic, as a knuckle dragging paramedic, I guess I tend to think of things like if they don't, if you don't use them every day, uh, you, you, they're they're not going to use it on disaster day, game day, and the same thing is applied to you know, some of this technology. We really wanted the guys to be able to use uh, Pulsera all the time. Um, there were some disaster capabilities of it that seemed beneficial, but I'll we'll get to that later. Um, Mainly it was about patient reports from the ambulance. I wanted it to be, you know, four, five, six clicks, scan a driver's license, you know, uh, whatever, and then send the patient report. And uh, then the the nurse, the triage nurse at uh, the hospital, the iPad starts going off with an alarm. And you know, the cool thing, there's just a couple of cool things. I thought it was neat. If you have two or three ambulances in route, they start auto sorting for the one that's going to arrive the soonest because Pulsera's, you know, tracking the um, phone when the app is on. And so it knows how close you are to the hospital. So the hospital actually gets a sorted list of patients that are going to be arriving first, second, third, et cetera. Um, the other benefit was that uh, depending on the package the hospital picked, um, 
they could actually upgrade that patient to what we call in our area we call them alert patients so we have um, a trauma alert or stroke alert uh, sepsis alert they can notify other people and add those other people to the to that to that channel um, for that particular patient which seems pretty slick to me um, to have this this capability and and the one thing I will tell you, they, the EMS guys aren't all that thrilled about the two-way communication. They they tend to throw the phone back in the, you know, in the action area or on the on the bench seat or whatever after. Um, so you know, they do have the ability to communicate back and forth, but a lot of times um, they, they don't necessarily look again until they get to the hospital. Uh, and I have a buddy of mine who's still riding the truck, and he said he's been the most impressed with the uh, voice to text. Um, it's, it's not, my Siri does okay, but not really. And this, whatever technology they're using for the medical dictation is fantastic. It's really, really slick. Um, anyway, uh, we, we started deploying this with EMS and, you know, some agencies wanted to provide devices to the truck. Some agencies said, you know, you can use your own device. We really left that up to each EMS agency's, you know, kind of privacy policies and that kind of stuff. Uh, there were a couple of benefits uh, when we talked about using it on on personal devices. If they take a picture or an image or a video, it stays on the app, but it does not stay in the phone's, um, you know, stored photos or anything like that. So it's completely uh, private with respect to any images or pictures or driver's license, whatever. Uh, I, I think that the transition time took a little longer than I thought it would, but not too long. Um, I would say within three months or so, five months, three to five months, people were using it fairly often. A little over half to some, some agencies are as high as 70, 75% um, of the MS runs are getting done through Pulsera. And then the others still fall back. You know, there's a, I haven't done this demographic check, but I think anybody, like over 45 probably is not using it as much and the medics that are under 45 seem to like the ability just to text and uh, text and uh, um, put the phone down. Yeah. Um, go ahead, Corey. Well, so we, um, you know, once we deployed that really out of necessity because the nurses couldn't hear the reports, as you said, these medics are wearing half mask APRs. Then all of a throw, all of a sudden, we got thrown a monkey wrench with El Paso, and and I thought that that was an interesting mission that I wanted to bring up um, because we did have some unique challenges there. And again, kind of, I'm going to go transition slides here. I know Eric, you might not be seeing exactly what I'm seeing, but uh, the first slide I'm going to show is is purely the distance challenge that we have with El Paso because um, in the map. You can't just drive from El Paso to somewhere in Texas in any amount of time that's, um, you know, it, it's going to take a while. So this was, what did we have, 300 plus patients probably that needed to be, be moved all in. And, um, you know, El Paso has maybe seven hospitals for a population that should probably have 14. And um, they're just simply backed up, as a lot of people were across the nation. But this logistical challenge meant that we needed to move all of these patients via fixed wing aircraft and distribute them across the state. And so, um, so Corey, let's um, I'd like to talk a little bit about the disaster response um, capabilities for Texas. We, we have um, regional medical operations centers in uh, each of the major areas. And so Dallas, Houston, Austin, San Antonio, Lubbock, El Paso. And those regional medical operations centers are the hubs during disaster for coordinating um, hospital EMS uh, needs and uh, responses. And so El Paso, and Corey alluded to it, everybody in Texas was inundated with COVID patients, of course, but almost all of the, of the areas in Texas were, were mainly uh, inundated because they didn't have enough staff. They didn't have enough nurses and when we got them nurses they could surge and open new wings or open new units and it worked you know it's the more nurses you could get the better you were but they no one was ever bed limited in texas uh in the urban areas except el paso and el paso is uh behind on the number of hospitals comparatively we have 
Um, we're, we're about two, two and a half million people here and we have um, about 25 hospitals and they have seven. You would think they would have, you know, half of what we have and uh, um, they would have 12 or 13 and they've got seven. So that they're behind on the number of actual hospitals with beds. And then during November, uh, sort of late October, November, December of um, 21, the, during the really big surge, they they bedded, I called it bedded out instead of staffed out, they bedded out, they had no more physical beds. We set up one of our biggest field hospitals in the parking lot of the level one trauma center there at UMC in El Paso. And it, as it got worse and worse and worse, we finally decided we were gonna start moving patients um, to load balance them across the rest of Texas. Uh, and he's right, I, I called it, uh, we were at Armox San Antonio, but I, I called it Moonbase El Paso because uh, it really is, it really is far. Um, um, from, if you can imagine it, it's closer El Paso is closer to Los Angeles than it is to Houston. So um, all of those patients moving had to uh, uh, had to go by fixed wing, had to go by jet. Um, our normal process of that when we first started without Pulsera was really challenging because we were having conference calls and hey, we got another patient holding, which one is this, et cetera. And um, by leveraging uh, the Pulsar app we had bought for a completely separate reason, but we were now going to use it for this inter facility transfer capability. So the local hospital could, you know, put a patient in and El Paso, the Armoc El Paso guys would try to figure it out. Yeah, there's the field hospital. And that's a good picture of the field hospital in the, um, in the university hospitals parking, university medical centers parking lot. Um, the, uh, uh, um, load balancing capabilities was really manual with dozens and sometimes dozens and dozens of phone calls. And we were using WebEOC and some other software to kind of track those. But the ability to start using uh, the hospitals, if you look at that slide right there on the left with those circles, let's say those were different hospitals and then they would send their patient on Pulsera into the, they call it the border rack, it's the Armoc in El Paso. And then uh, if the border act would check with the other local hospitals um, in the uh, alternate care facility, if they were inundated and couldn't accept the patient, then the patient was shipped to something we called a virtual placement center with the state coordination office. And the state coordination office's uh, coordination center would send those patients to all the other um, RMOCs and they would socialize it. And then you could pick up the patient and sort of accept the patient from that virtual placement center in the software. And this, this eliminated almost all the phone calls. Almost all the phone calls were, were eliminated. Um, and then as we, even to the point where we could add the jet, once the jet was dispatched to go to the call, that crew was on there and you know the, the receiving hospital was seeing what was going on as people um, put patients in put inputs in like, hey, we just landed at the airport, we're on the way to the hospital. It was just so much richer uh, um, understanding about what was going on with those transfers, very helpful. So yeah, we, we learned a lot with that. It was kind of like an aha moment. Like we didn't actually intend our software to be able to do that. We just sort of, it, it bent in such a way that we said, hey, I think this could work. And, um, you know, I, I deployed out to El Paso and within about 48 hours, we had all of those hospitals up and running um, and then had other resources at the statewide coordination center helping out. But it was really kind of cool to see that being able to have that shared awareness through a TAC channel where all of the people that had a vested interest in that patient's either movement or care or logistical needs was in the same channel really got rid of all of those phone calls. Um, so that that sort of springboarded us, I guess, into a, a different world of Pulsera and um, by learning that. So the, the next thing I want to transition to, because this is this is pre pre Pulsera, completely independent of Pulsera, is the concept of statewide wristbands. And I think if there's anything that I want to get across in this webinar is that I think states can really benefit from a statewide wristband with or without technology like Pulsera. So this is not a sales pitch for Pulsera. This is being a cheerleader for the concept of a statewide wristband. And so Eric, I think 
it would be really important to understand why did you guys even have the concept of a statewide wristband? What was the background on that? How has, has it evolved, et cetera? So thanks. We um, at the GTAC disaster committee, we had been talking for um, 10 years about patient tracking and the ability to put a wristband on that could be, you know, help track the patient's movement. And we had some wristbands from the state uh, emergency management office for a while. And they use them to track their gen pop, uh, the evacuees going to general population shelters. Uh, the problem with the wristbands in the disaster environment was you never had them when you needed them. You, you, it's like you had to find, you had to go to an EOC and pick them up, or they had to bring out a big back boxes of them to the ambulances. Like it just wasn't really easy to use to get the wristbands d distributed. Um, and you're talking about, you know, in some cases we had the FEMA ambulance contract with 250 extra ambulances. You're talking about three or 400 ambulances and, you know, getting all of those wristbands uh, deployed. And so I always felt like if the ambulances could just have the, the wristbands with them because they use them every day, like they have a box of gloves, it'd be good if they had a box of wristbands and then we could use them for disaster. And that led us to thinking about, well, what could we use them for on a day-to-day -day basis? So the, the you know, EMS guys were, were used to using them and, and it was good muscle memory. So separately in our region in STRAC, in San Antonio, we had had trouble building a longitudinal uh, um, record for patients for that one episode. So one trauma episode, you're out on the border at Lake Amistad near Del Rio, and uh, your buddy gooses the boat and runs you over with the boat on the boat dock and, you know, busts your pelvis and you have a pneumothorax and you're hurt really bad. They call EMS. Well, EMS is going to pick you up and they're going to rush you to the, this is, in that case, it's a level four smaller uh, hospital. They're going to treat you there. And then they're going to fly you to San Antonio. And then you go to the level one trauma center. And, you know, from there, uh, you probably get better. Um, but, but if you thought about it from the electronic medical record system, trying to make that all work together, there was an EMS record from the boat dock to the small hospital. There was a trauma registry record. Um, there was an EMR and a trauma registry entry for the, the care at the level four. Then there's the helicopter trip with you know, another electronic medical record, and finally at the tertiary center. Um, so those four things, when we said we need to build, you know, um, bridges to be able to make that patient, where you can see all, you could look at that longitudinal journey from a quality and performance improvement perspective from all kinds of reasons. And every time we met with the data people, they would say, well, do you have a common field do you have a common number do you have a common you know identifier we're like no everybody has a run number or some other kind of thing but they're different all of them are different and so then that leads you if you if you've ever had to do this talking to the data people they want to talk about probabilistic matching which is like where well, you have their last name and their date of birth and you use a bunch of stuff and kind of match it up and that works okay i mean it works you know 80 90 percent but you're still going to be left daily with like 10 or 15, 20%. They're going to have to be manually matched and go, is this the same person? Yes, no. I mean, you've got twin boys, right? They both have the last name and the same date of birth. And they were both in the car in the boat wreck, right? So there, there was always these challenges with probabilistic matching. And it felt like if we could have a common number, if you had a wristband that the EMS guy put on first and he entered that into the EMR, then you would automatically put that into the, the, the level four you know, record and then the helicopter record and then the trauma center record and suddenly being able to match up on that on that one field, you know, with the date with like a you know their last name or something as a backup was really, really valuable. On the disaster committee side, I thought, man, if we can make that happen, then the guys would already have the wristband in the truck. They would they because they use them every day. Um, Jeff Tabor, a friend of mine from Little Rock, Arkansas, uh, he was doing um, reserve duty. I think he's a Navy uh, reservist, and he had been in San Antonio and come by the office. And I was telling him about this idea, and he happens to work in Little Rock at the at MEMS at Metropolitan EMS. And uh, 
you know, Jeff and his team, they went back and met with their state people and they implemented the wristband like five or seven years, five, six years ago in Arkansas. And I was like, man, I can't believe they're doing that and we're not doing it. So we really tried to make a push for it. And so we came up with this Texas EMS wristband. Um, the top one is kind of the version one, a little more inexpensive. We're probably gonna keep both versions. Version two is uh, work that's been done on a next gen V2 uh, wristband. It's not live yet, but that's work that the Dallas Fort Worth, the North Central Texas rack, um, uh, Jim and Rick up in uh, the, the Dallas Fort Worth rack have really worked hard with their EMS ANGs. And th this has a lot more features um, on it as well. But that common number, if you see the A00001, there's uh, should be you know six to seven digits with that, but they're alphanumeric. And then we in Texas are using the A uh, to identify if there's different vendors who are making the, the wristband. Right now we have two for sure. Then they each have a different, uh, that way the numbers can never be um, duplicated. They'll be uh, individual because of the vendor letter. I think you guys on, on the SIMSO have also agreed because of Joe Schmieder to add a TX or the whatever. That's the way license plates work, right? Li li license plates are all unique because if each state does them, but they put a TX or a LA or a IL in front of you know the, the, the license plate, um, then you never have a duplicate uh, number. So we think that's super important and that states should use TX and then that A0001. If you're across state lines, you're one of those border communities you know, next to another state, the wristbands could work uh, no matter what and always be uh, uh, unique. So um, this disaster committee has been working on this wristband thing completely separate from Pulsera. We weren't even talking to them about it and uh, they were working on some driver's license um, scanning or something, I think. And I said, well, can it can it scan the wristband? Could you even do that? And Corey said, well, I don't know, let me check. And so they they figured out a way uh, to, to update the software and scan the wristband and um, Corey, I'll sort of turn it over to you to talk about what you guys, some of the magic you've done with that. Yeah, um, so it really was was sort of a match made in heaven, honestly. It was, as you like to say, uh, we were peanut butter and they were chocolate and we made Reese's. But, um, you know, if, if we're gonna build a system of care that scales, and the definition of that is, look, we're gonna use the exact same system every single day to build muscle memory for success. Um, so that when we have a stress event, whether that's the active shooter, whether that's a tornado, whether that's, I mean, Texas does so many hurricane evacuations. I mean, um, it's just, unfortunately, it's your specialty, right? And, and you guys have gotten really good at it. But when those events happen, if you try to pull something off the shelf that you only use on the worst day of your life, it is destined to fail. And I think that's the mistake that people make over and over and over again is they, they spend millions of dollars on technology or infrastructure and things that are only used one day every five years or something. And they expect people to, to have the muscle memory. And so what our concept was is no, everybody has these devices. It's ubiquitous. We have mobile devices. We're using those to text our mother, to get groceries from our wife, whatever the case is. So use that every single day, use these wristbands, put them on every single patient. So this is the toe pain that goes to triage. This is the chest pain that goes to a cath lab, the trauma that goes to the trauma bay. Use it every single patient. Then when we do have something bad, it's no different. And so my mantra is every day is disaster day. So I'm gonna attempt to show a video here of just a simple patient report that goes from EMS to a hospital it's gonna be a chest pain, but I'm gonna scan a couple of pieces of things. So I'm gonna scan this statewide wristband first, and then I'm gonna scan a driver's license. And you'll see how I can actually create a report with zero data entry, because we have other integrations such as cardiac monitor interfaces and things like that. And then I'm gonna shoot the information over to a hospital. And because I can't give demographics over a radio, I can give it through Pulsera. And now, I've got protected health information in a HIPAA compliant wrapper that these hospitals can then pre-register. They can get the patient moved through a system faster. 
So hopefully we won't have a lag with this, um, but we'll let the video play and, and uh, hopefully everything works well. So I think it's definitely, it's definitely you. <laughs> Just watching nothing's playing yet, Corey. I'll tell you when it starts. Okay. There we go. So you can see we're scanning the driver's license. We already scanned the statewide wristband. Um, if I'm talking a little bit faster than what the video is playing, it'll catch up. But taking pictures of things like medication list, face sheets from you know a nursing home, whatever is necessary, I'm gonna then pull in an EKG from a cardiac monitor. And that way a 12 lead can be shared. Wristband just popped up on the video. I think the lag may be on your end. I'm getting feedback that it's it's going. Okay. Um, and then I'm just going to talk to text uh, with this. No need to do any data entry. This is what um, you know Eric was talking about earlier. That being able to just talk freely, just like I'm talking in a radio to do a radio report, is really the key. And even if something doesn't get spelled exactly right um, <clears throat> phonetically, somebody on the other end is going to be able to make heads or tails out of it. And then we're going to send this patient report to a hospital. Um, at that point, you'll see an iPad on the right, and even the browser in the background is uh, being alerted. And the, whoever's on the other end that's uh, responsible for making these uh, determinations on patient care can see all of the information. And then um, if they're using our product to its fullest capabilities, if they want to press an activate button and then the on-call cardiologist and cath lab get pulled into the channel, then that's great. Uh, but that muscle memory right there that I just showed is really the key to success um, because it leads us to the next video, which is going to be, um, and I'm going to do a hurricane evacuation with this, but this could take this exact same video that I'm about to show and apply it to the tornado, the active shooter, the rollover collision with 10 patients, whatever the case is, um, if we're doing this right, then that really, that scenario is no different. So here's our next video. Um, and so I'll talk through this as well um, as it's going. So we have the ability to create an incident and name that incident or a mission assignment, whatever your terminology is. I'm gonna pull up a map here and let's just say that we need to evacuate a hospital and this hospital is at this uh, latitude and longitude. So I, I just throw that over that location. I can also set a geofence around that location. I can name the location and what that geofence does is it allows any responder that is coming to that incident to respond to join that incident and create patient channels for that incident to tie it. Um, and then I'm just gonna set and default a particular patient type so that it doesn't take many keystrokes here. At the same time, you'll see in the background, I have a browser version. So incident commands, RMOX, folks like that can join this incident as well. Uh, we can share this with other entities. Uh, so if there are other organizations that need to be part of that incident, whether it's a regional, state, or local level, um, then they would be able to do that. And I'm simply going to create the first patients that need to be tied to this incident. And I may not put very much information in if it's a, you know, an MCI, uh, but if this is what I'm doing right now, a hurricane evacuation, I'm able to put a little bit more information in. Certainly the minimum would be at least a patient color for their triage level. Um, but in this case, we actually know who we're dealing with and we've got a little bit of time to put information in on that patient. The other thing is responders can take pictures of belongings, right? It's a lot like moving an Amazon package where when we deliver this, we want to make sure everything we took from point A gets to point B. Um, and because these are not just Amazon packages, these are actually patients that have real complaints and they're in a hospital or something in this situation, there are medical things that we need to know about these patients. 
So I create that channel. And what you'll see is that at an RMOC level, at a regional, state, local level, whoever those stakeholders need to know about who these patients are that are tied to that event, they'll be able to see those uh, because they may have different reasons that they are involved in this from a logistical standpoint, coordination, et cetera. So you see how I, I put that first one in. I'm just gonna fast forward a little bit uh, for time's sake and, um, and create the second patient so that you can kind of see how this works. So now I've got two patients, and the one thing I want you to see is that the summary report says I've got two patients at this particular facility that need to be moved. And now as we move through that process, anyone that comes into contact with that patient, and in Texas that would be our EMTF resources, ambulance strike teams, and uh, folks like that, they can scan that wristband, they are added into the channel, so they are part of that continuity of care. Now this iPad on the right is the receiving facility where this patient is going to end up. It may have exchanged 10 hands along the way, but when I get to that facility, that facility is gonna scan that wristband and they're gonna say, hey, they've arrived and they're at my facility safely. So everyone that was involved in that patient's movement can see that. And more importantly, the sending facility, when they get a family member that calls them that says, hey, where's grandma? Uh, well, actually they just arrived at the Alamo Dome and they're safe. And so as you're, you'll see here, we've got a summary report that I'll pull up where I can now see on that tracking that we have one patient still at a facility. Our second patient is actually at their destination safe. So if we apply that to something like an active shooter, we may have 40 patients and we would know at any given time how many are still on scene, what level are they, how many are in route to a hospital, how many have actually made it to that destination. So with that, I'd, I'd like to, to see if there are uh, some questions from the audience, anything that, uh, that you guys were curious about, and, um, and then we can, we can go from there. So, Corey, while there's questions maybe coming in, um, you didn't talk about the fact if you know, unless she's the MCI situation where there's a triage and then a you know a treatment area, casualty collection point, et cetera. And, you know, the color, maybe some other information about what's been done or what they saw with the patient. And then a lot of times you'll see another ambulance pull up, and it might be from a completely different. Um, EMS agency that's going to be, you know, part of the transport team and all they have to do uh, from the EMS guys who are showing up in the ambulance is scan the wristband and they're automatically added to the channel that the triage and treatment guys have been producing the whole time. And then when they pick the destination hospital, everybody's added to that whole record. Yeah, we see that daily, really, because you have a first responder that will start a channel they'll scan a wristband and put it on a patient and then your ground ambulance shows up to take that patient. Well, of course they're gonna get a verbal handoff, but they also just scan the wristband and now they're added into the channel and they may be transporting and the first responder stays on scene and keeps adding pictures of mechanism of injury or, hey, I found a, a pill bottle. But if we hand it off to air even, it goes a step further and that air asset gets on scene and they can scan the wristband and now they're added into the channel. And whether they're using it or not in the air, really doesn't matter, they're in that channel with the ground unit. And you and I both know from being in that, that world, there's a lot of questions that we have. Sometimes I'm, I'm thinking, yeah, I wonder if they gave vecuronium, how much did they give? What did they use to try to intubate this person? How many attempts? All of that, I have to try to track that crew back down and things like that. With, with the wristband, that continuity of care is completely seamless then. And so we, we really happened upon this and the, the benefits have been pretty tremendous. Okay. Any questions yeah. coming in, Corey? I don't see any. I think you got some on Slack. Oh, there we go. Um, so one of the questions, um, what about local or regional competition um, with other healthcare entities and things like that? So I think, you know, 
maybe speak to that, Eric, about how we've kind of solved that with with Texas uh, by kind of standardizing this across the, the state? Well, uh, there are other products out there. The the This may have been just lucky, but the fact that we were in the middle of the pandemic and we were able to do the procurement the way we did um, allowed us that the state is picking up, the, I'll call it the EMS portion um, of the technology. And then if the hospital wants, that gets the hospital the, the alerting and capabilities for an EMS transport. But if they want to manage their if they want to manage their cardiac team or their stroke team or any of those other things, that's something the hospital kind of does on their own. But the fact the state already purchased it and manages it for, you know, all EMS agencies in the state, uh, the hospitals, you know, basically said, well, we're, some of them are going to use it just for that purpose for the EMS report. And others are really, we're seeing them more and more of this transfer capability for uh, interfacility transfers and then notifying their teams. Um, inside the building it seems seems like that's that's become pretty popular it also helps us when we're having a load balance like we're doing from el paso they they got to see that work you know kind of real real time and that was good there, there was another question about if other states are doing this as well if it's just texas and i can tell you you know you mentioned arkansas and a statewide wristband in arkansas um, and we we scan that one as well, and we do actually have a, a statewide contract with Arkansas as well. So so we have some interoperability, not in not just within our own state, but if the tornado came through Texarkana, we've got patients strewn across multiple states. It doesn't matter. We've got responders in Texas, responders in Arkansas. They look the same to Pulsera. We do not care. They can use their wristband. We can use our wristband in Texas. Pulsera can scan either one, and that continuity of care is exactly the same. Really, it is the ultimate interoperability. I think we've kind of cracked the nut on that with this this dual um, technology with um, the wristbands. So, and I know that other states, um, you know, not to name them, but there are other states out there that have definitely taken a particular interest in this and are moving in this direction as well. The, the biggest thing I kind of wanted to do with this webinar is show people that there is a blueprint and um, despite a lot of the, the politics and things like that with good leadership and vision you can get this done and if you are going to partic participate in a statewide wristband project take some of the lessons that have been learned by arkansas by texas and put that number that tx or that va for virginia or you know that at the beginning and let's have a standardized nomenclature for how these numbers are done so that they don't walk on each other and we don't duplicate uh, those numbers and then finally yeah go ahead Eric. for you yeah the you know the the pulsera thing being separate the wristband project i think um one of the things we're working on now with some of the big uh, emr vendors like uh epic and uh um, i can't remember the other one we're working okay. directly with on this idea but the ems guys that transport and say well okay i'm gonna put this wristband on I'm gonna put it in my EMR. How does that really help me? But what's the win for me, the paramedic that's on the truck, whatever? And so our idea that we're working on actively now is by having that number tie back, the hospital can provide their um, either ER registration or ideally the hospital admissions, demographics, and billing information. Because the best thing on the planet, you know, the the worst. The worst information is what the paramedics get. Honestly, they're really not very good registration clerks. And then, you know, the next part of that, it's a little better than the paramedics is the registration clerks and the ER. But that's still an outpatient visit at that point. When they go to admissions, that's when I think they get the really best information possible on their demographics and billing and capabilities. And so uh, the EMS agency, we think there will be a direct um, improvement in the quality of the billing uh, information. And, you know, there are products out there that do this, HDE and other things, but uh, a lot of those, if you don't have the, this would say, you know, the wristband kind of saves having to get the uh, the admissions, the MRN or whatever number you have to have. And so uh, tying that together with the wristband, making that automated, we think that would be a benefit to the to the EMS agency. And speaking of the EMS agencies, there was another question just about EPCR integration. And of course, 
Coursera has a public API. We are happy to share our data with anybody. We want to be agnostic and it's all about collaboration. So we do have EPCR vendors out there that uh, currently digest our information. As you can see, whenever I did the first video, there's really no manual data entry, but sure would be nice if, because I was able to scan that driver's license and those other pictures and things like that, that I was able to talk to text the chief complaint, that could just flow right into the EPCR. That's definitely a bonus. And so we do have EPCR vendors today doing that, and it is open to any EPCR vendor in order to participate and, and we'll share our data with them. Who do you have automatic? Uh, do you already have some with, which ones do you have that work today? So um, Beyond Lucid, EPR Systems, Image Trend, just to name a few. Okay, good. This is Kelly. Here's a question that um, has come across. Are there, are there any hidden costs to our hospitals? Um, does the state pay for both daily use as well as patient tracking? So yes, the the state of Texas is covering the cost um, of the daily use for. And Corey, you can help me with the uh, the actual exact names, but it's like the unlimited version for EMS, but that comes with the daily use capability, obviously for the hospital, because if the hospital if the EMS guys can't talk to the hospital, there's no you you know. So the, now the iPads and all that stuff is on the hospital to buy. Um, but they, if, if they buy, and by the way, when we use the iPads, we added, we made sure they put um, the LTE capability, which is another expense that's kind of ongoing, but it's not too bad. But the value of that is it didn't have to be hooked to the hospital's IT system, which saved tons of, of you know, paperwork and problems with the hospitals. Uh, having to add some device that they didn't, you know, that, that they didn't want on their network. So um, the state's covering those costs, and that that allows us to do load balancing in disaster times, track the hurricane patients or a mass fatality, and our uh, MCI, and also on a daily use basis. Now, the part that there's, I wouldn't call it hidden. It's pretty obvious what the costs are. But if the, the hospital, if they want to use it internally because they, they see value in adding their cath lab, for instance, their cath lab team, there's a cost that Pulsera does directly with the hospital and goes and talks to them about it. But it'll work perfectly for the EMS pre-hospital purpose and for the load balancing purpose, and, not, and there's no expense to the hospital. I mean, beyond the iPad or, you know, having devices, you know, to put on it if they don't use um, their own devices. Yep, you hit the nail on the head. Um, when you when you mentioned kind of that that, um, premium product for EMS. I'll just explain that really quickly because, you know, we did realize in COVID that, boy, if we could reduce the surge in the first place with some of these patients that could be navigated in other such ways, that would be great. And so the state definitely wanted any EMS out there to be able to have the capability to navigate these patients and utilize our platform to collaborate with partners that they have in the community um, so if you've got a substance abuse patient, a, a, um, a mental health patient, folks like that or lower acuity that maybe could have prescriptions and just a telehealth visit. So there are folks in San Antonio, Austin and the like that utilize this daily so that EMS gets on scene of a lower acuity patient, consults in their medical control hub, has a telehealth consult with a, a medical control doc, and then they navigate that patient appropriately. And that helps to a, improve the patient satisfaction because they're actually getting the care that they needed, don't have to sit on the wall in a hospital for hours. The hospital likes it because they actually got the patients that needed their care and not the ones that didn't. And, um, and usually there is a benefit monetarily to the community as well because we're not sucking those resources. So um, when done right, it is very powerful. Um, I have a question. So. Are you using this in smaller, like rural hospitals? Yeah, yeah, we uh, the the yeah, it works fine. I mean, almost all of them have. I mean, at this point, everybody has data. If you're in a town that uh, you may have places that are farther out of town in the rural areas that might not have coverage, but almost every smaller town where there's a hospital, it's going to have internet, uh, or they can use their Wi-Fi if uh, if they need to. So yeah, we've had we've had good luck with that as well. Interesting. So another question is here. Um, if we had 
uh, an event like an MCI, you know, some big, big event. Um, can our hospitals actually add those patients to the incident? Yes. Yep. In fact, we want the hospitals, if they show up and they're going to be transferred or an MCI, they, they have wristbands at the hospitals as well. And they stick the, they stick the wristband on, scan it, and they can add that to Pulsera as well at the hospital. I mean, I, I think it's kind of hilarious in the EMS world for 30 years. We've, we've even trained the media that the only patients we seem to know about is running a mass casualty uh, are the patients we transported. Because all the patients ran off, it's like, well, uh, I mean, every if you look at all the active shooter scenes for the last, you know, thirty of them, people are leaving by cab, by pickup truck, by donkey. There's the, the pulse shooting. There were people running, carrying them, you know, on their backs. So, so the idea that EMS is going to transport, you know, even a per, a large percentage of the patients, I think, is a misnomer. I think there was a study done by somebody from Emory that it's like between 15 and 30 percent of the total casualty count at the end is going to be, you know, by EMS. Now, are those the sickest? You know, probably. There's a lot of people who are walking wounded that just managed to get to the hospital one way or the other. But, but it's you know, how many people got hurt and how many were injured? That seems like something the incident command system would want to know. But it's almost unknowable when everybody's running off. Um, so I think it's easier to count them. It's like having a conference where you count the people, you count them at registration at the hotel when they're checking in. I don't know how they got there by American Airlines, by a bus line, by a car. I just want to know who checked into the hotel, right? And I, I think that's a simpler and easier way to do it, and it's less frenetic, uh, and it gives you kind of a comprehensive picture of how bad the situation uh, is. Can this also do telehealth, live video, anything like that? Yeah, yes. of course, I showed that earlier. Okay. Okay. It, can, it can be recorded, it can be group video. So, you know, if I have a sending physician at a small rural hospital that needs to have some type of a consult um, with a specialist, those are all things that we can help broker through the system and um, in that way that patient can receive the right care. Excellent. Okay, I've got one more. And then it looks like we'll kind of wrap up. This one is age old because of all, you know, as we all know, the privacy and, and things of that nature going on. But are photos limited? I know you talked a little bit about taking photos. Can you can you take pictures of anything like the patient, scene, belongings, et cetera? Um, have you have you had any any pitfalls or any great challenge or any great, you know, pearls of thoughts for that? Yeah, so I think a lot of the policy will change. Go ahead, Eric. I think the matchup, you know, um, of uh, reunification with, you know, some of the mass uh, shootings, being able to take take pictures and match up, because you may not have their names, but you, you, that those, as long as, you know, the face is intact, at least, or pictures of the clothes, um, that's been another thing that's been kind of a challenge when the clothes get cut off. If you can take a picture of a you know of a child, and then the parents can go, yeah, that's what he was wearing this morning. I mean, this is a horrible problem to have that we're trying to discuss right now. Just you know, I've got three kids myself. It's just frustrating that we're in this situation. But solving that so that there's closure and there's quick ways to track those people, the photos are really helpful. Um, and that's all. Again, I mean, I think Corey said it earlier. It's on the it's on the app. It's not on the device. So those pictures are not saved. You know, to the photo, to the photos app, or anything like that. That's real. That's interesting. Thank you so much. So, um, I think we're going to wrap it up a little bit here. I would like to thank all of you for participating in today's webinar. Everyone from the SEMSO and and other folks that have been able to drop in and take advantage of this opportunity. Uh, again, a huge thank you to Pulsera, to Corey Ricketson, to Eric Apley, just for sharing some of these practices with our communities and um, just making things safer 